Amen. Good morning. Great to see you here. We want to dismiss our children for Sunday school. Last Sunday, we studied the first nine verses of Revelation chapter 12. And those verses introduce three of the main personages, we could call them that, in the book of Revelation and in the future time called the Tribulation. Those personages are the glorious woman, which represents Israel, her son, our offspring, Jesus Christ, and the dragon or serpent, which we also know as Satan or the devil. So to review, I want to reread those verses from Revelation chapter 12, if you'll follow with me on the screen. Beginning in verse 1, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in labor and agony as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. There was a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems, or kingly crowns. His tail swept away a third of the stars in heaven and hurled them to the earth, which we said last week were fallen angels. His tail uh, and the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth, so that she did that when she did give birth, he might devour her child. But she gave birth to a son, a male, who is going to shepherd all nations with an iron scepter. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne, which pictures the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, 33 years plus after his birth. Verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God to be fed there for 1260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels also fought, but he could not prevail. And there was no place for them, the devil and his angels, in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was thrown out. The ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the one who deceives the whole world, he was thrown to earth and his angels with him. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you join me, please? Father, how I thank you that the words of this paragraph are true, that Satan has been, will be cast out of heaven in the future, that he has been defeated at the cross, that he has been sentenced, and only the final incarceration and execution, we would say, uh, is yet to be. And so we thank you that for that great victory won, as we shall see in a moment, by the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I intercede at the moment for those in need in our church who need work. Lord, I pray for those with health needs, those who uh, need comfort in grief. Lord, you know each heart, each need in each family, and so we commit those to you. Lord, I pray that our eyes would be open to opportunities to witness both in our words and in our actions and demonstrating your truth both by what we say in terms of the gospel and our words and conversation as well as uh, the acts of kindness that we would do. And Lord, I would particularly pray overseas for the uh, great country of Peru and South America with the horrible floods that are occurring there, the landslides, the mudslides, the devastation. Just pray for, uh, Lord, uh, uh, clear paths for the government to get aid to those who are, who are in need, uh, for there to not be um, other things that go wrong. And so I pray for the soon end to those rains so that people can be rescued and their lives can get back to normal. So commit the uh, Peruvians, many of whom I know and love. So Lord, we now commit this message to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Today, <clears throat> after this passage we read just now, we want to look at the great hymn that is going to be sung or spoken in heaven uh, as a result of Satan being cast out, we think at the midpoint of that future tribulation. Verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven, John says. He said, that voice said, The salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Messiah have now come because the accuser of our brothers has been thrown out, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. They conquered Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, 
for they did not love their lives in the face of death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you with great fury, because he knows he has a short time. We see here in this passage for the third time in three verses, it says that Satan will be cast out or thrown out of heaven. That is reason to celebrate. The celebrations that will take place at that point in the future will be greater than the celebrations of the victory in World War II of the United States and the other allies, which was called V-Day on May 8, 1945. Those celebrations over World War II's victory will be nothing compared to the celebrations in the future uh, when Satan is cast out of heaven. Now, this marvelous hymn that we have just looked at is God's answer to the Lord's prayer. Let's look at that. Notice here in Matthew 6, 13, Jesus said, And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The path to the deliverance from the evil one will be when he is thrown out of heaven. And notice the last part, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever that ends the Lord's prayer. Notice how this contains the power and the kingdom. Uh, so there's an echo there of the Lord's Prayer in this future hymn that will be sung in heaven. Now, Jesus ascended to heaven. We saw that described earlier in that passage. And when before he left this earth, he made this statement. Let's go ahead to the next slide. Then Jesus came near, verse 18 of Matthew 28, and said to the disciples, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And so we see here in this passage in Revelation how Jesus will exercise the authority that he has been given through Michael and the good angels to throw Satan out of heaven. And what is one of Satan's primary activities in heaven right now? He is our accuser, living up to his name Satan, the adversary, and living up to his name the devil, the slanderer. Like Satan accused Job long ago, I'm sure that the devil also accuses us in heaven because he still has access there. The word accused here is very, very interesting in Greek. Notice the first part of this word, kategoreo. The word kata in Greek, a very small, it's a preposition, and among other things it means down and it means against. And this very well describes Satan's accusations against us. He puts us down to God. And that is why the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ right now, right this moment in heaven is so significant as our great high priest because Jesus is interceding for us believers every time we sin. Let's look at that great, uh, those great verses in Romans chapter 8 beginning in verse 33. Paul asks, who can bring an accusation against God's elect? Well, Satan tries. But the answer is, God is the one who justifies us. Verse 34, who is the one who condemns us? Christ Jesus is the one who died. But even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. When we Christians sin on earth, which is every day, Jesus intercedes for us in heaven on the grounds that we are justified by His blood. On earth, we have our part to play when we sin, which is we need to get back into fellowship with God. Our sins have been covered, but our fellowship is interrupted, so we need through repentance, through confession, like 1 John 1, 9, to return to fellowship with Him after we sin. God cleanses all of our sins forever, and we need to remember that through the cross. So we should not keep getting down on ourselves when we fail. That is one of Satan's lies that he uses to defeat us. So next time you are tempted to get down on yourself because of your failures, remember Romans chapter 8. I just encourage you sometime to read that entire chapter. I know people, I once in my life committed the entire chapter to memory. I've probably lost part of it by now. But Romans 8 basically describes our destiny as Christians. It begins with no condemnation, and it ends with no separation. 
so that no matter how badly we fail, our salvation is secure in Christ, not because of what we do, but because of what Christ did for us on the cross. Now, those who sing or recite this great hymn that we saw in Revelation 12, we believe that they are the martyrs from the tribulation period because notice they say, our brothers, our God, and it describes how they have overcome Satan, not in their own strength, but by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, testimony being this same Greek word we've seen before, martyrius, from which we get our English word martyr, and the word here is probably God's word that they are testifying about. These martyrs did not love their lives in the face of death. They had the same attitude that Paul had in Philippians 1.21. Let's look at that. For, me, for to me to live is Christ, Paul said, and to die is gain. When you face death someday, even if earthly authorities are threatening to kill you for being a Christian, could you have this attitude that to die is gain? And of course, the answer that we need to say is, we would have this attitude like Paul, by God's strength, by his power to be able to die that way. Now, Satan is not a dummy. He knows prophecy better than we do. So he knows at this point in the tribulation that he will only have an, a short three and a half year window left to him. So he takes out his irrational rage on the nation of Israel. Let's look at that in verse 13. When the dragon saw he had been thrown to earth, he persecuted the woman, Israel, who gave birth to the male child, Jesus. But God will protect at least some Israelites during that time. We believe that group includes the 144,000 Jews that we saw were sealed and protected in chapter 7 of Revelation. And I want us to then now go back to a verse we read last week. We read it this morning, but we didn't talk about it last week. I saved it until now, and that's verse 6. The woman fled into the wilderness, or desert, where she had a place prepared by God to be fed there 1,260 days, or three and a half years of 30-day months. Today, refuge, refugees are in the news. We hear daily, weekly about refugees. Have you ever wondered why God allows so many people to be uprooted around the world and forced to flee their homes to other places? Well, obviously, there are human explanations, but spiritually, God allows that, I am sure, so that a number of those refugees will find the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Because when everything you know and love and own is taken away from you, you are confronted with the most basic issues of life. And so God allows these terrible things to happen to these poor refugees so that many of them will find Christ. And so I think the future displacement of Israel at the midpoint of the tribulation will be part of what God uses to bring a number of them to faith in Jesus as their Messiah. But Jesus predicted that this would happen, this future exodus of His chosen people in the famous Olivet prophetic discourse on, uh, from the Mount of Olives. And let's look at that briefly in Mark chapter 13, beginning in verse 14. Jesus predicts, when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it should not, we'll study that next week, Revelation 13, the Antichrist desecrates the temple in Jerusalem. And then Mark adds this little parenthesis, let the reader understand what Jesus is talking about from Daniel chapter 9. Then those in Judah, or rather in Judea, must flee to the mountains. A man on the housetop in Jerusalem must not come down or go in to get anything out of his house. And a man in the field must not go back to get his clothes. Woe to pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days. Pray it won't happen in winter, for those will be days of tribulation. The kind that hasn't been from the beginning of the world, which God created, until now and never will be again. Unless the Lord limited those days, no one would survive. But He limited those days because of the elect whom He chose. So God limits that last terrible three and a half years of the tribulation to just that length, or the whole world would be destroyed. 
Now these verses were partially fulfilled when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. And it's very interesting that Christians who were living in Jerusalem in 69 and 70, when they saw the Roman armies marching in and to surround the city, they fled the city. They heeded Jesus' warning and they saved their lives. But the Jews who did not believe in Jesus as their Messiah, they did not heed this prophecy. They stayed in Jerusalem and they perished. But there will yet be a future fulfillment of this when God comes to the aid of fleeing Israelites for that last 1260 days or three and a half years of the tribulation. This phrase, let's go forward. I love this phrase, a place prepared by God where this woman Israel will flee into the wilderness, into the desert, to the mountains, a place prepared by God. God will arrange, prepare a special place of refuge for those fleeing Israelites. Does that phrase remind you of anything? I hope it does, because Jesus is preparing a place for us Christians. Let's look at that in John chapter 14, verse 1. Jesus said on that last night before He was crucified, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to Myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I believe this is the first clear teaching in Scripture about the rapture, when Christ takes us out of this world, those of us who know Him personally as, as believers, and takes us to that prepared place in heaven which He has for us. But God will also protect those from Israel in the future to an earthly place He has prepared for them. Now, where will that be? Well, many Bible students believe that Israel's hiding place will be in Petra. Petra is the ancient, beautiful, natural fortress made of red uh, sandstone, caves, and cliffs in the desert, desolate mountains of modern Jordan. Now, we're going to have a little show and tell right now. First show, and you actually, these are two stones from Petra that I brought almost 20 years ago when I visited there, and I'm going to pass these around, and I would like you to look at them, touch them, and keep passing them on to the very back, till they get to the very back to, I guess, Steve and to the Nellums, and uh, if they don't make it back there, or if someone borrows it, these stones permanently, God will get you. And now, they're, they're part of my permanent collection, so I want to use them again for children and others uh, to show them. But let's look at some slides now of what Petra looks like. These are the mountains of Edom. This is Ammon, Jordan, like the Ammonites in the Old Testament that David fought. And so these are some of the most desolate, barren places on earth. Let's go forward. And to get to Petra, can we go forward? Okay, thank you. Oh, by the way, if you love to do stargazing at night, there's no light from any city there in, in Petra, and so the, you can view the Milky Way in all of its spectacular glory. Go, go forward. This is the entrance to Petra, this gorge called the Sikh. Its maximum width is 16 feet. It is usually much, much narrower than that with high scale walls. Keep going, and you get your first view of the treasury, now let's go forward again, and this is the treasury. Those of you who remember the third Indiana Jones movie, they filmed the exteriors here, where the one where he was looking for the, the Holy Grail. And so this is a close-up of the top of this carved from solid sandstone like you are, uh, it's being passed around right now. Absolutely gorgeous. It should be one of the wonders of the ancient world. Go forward. But this is the basic city of Petra. It's caves... Uh, naturally occurring caves, caves that have been rocked. And so basically, you've got houses, you've got all kinds of places just ready to move in, possibly someday, and go forward. And finally, 20 years ago, this is another Indiana Jones, moi, uh, in my fedora. And this is a wonderful horse that I actually rode through that narrow path into. This is the entrance to Petra before you get to the gorge. So I thought I would share those. It is a real place. And let's look at a couple of scriptures that 
may indicate that Petra is one of the places. So Isaiah chapter 16, verse 1. Isaiah the prophet says, Send lambs to the ruler of the land from Selah, which is Petra, in the desert to the mountain of the daughter of daughter Zion. And then Isaiah 63, verse 1. Who is this coming from Edom? Edom in Hebrew referring to the descendants of Esau, but similar to the word for red. You remember the whole story of Esau, probably a red-headed guy uh, who made red soup and all these things. But who is this coming from Edom in crimson stained garments from Basra, this one who is splendid in his apparel, rising up proudly in his great might? We believe this is a prophecy of Israel's Messiah, Jesus, at his second coming. He is the one who will be dressed in red. And someday if we study Isaiah, the interesting thing is the crimson on his gold clothes there will probably be the blood of his enemies that he slays. First time when Jesus came, he was covered with his own blood. The second time he comes, he will be covered with his enemies whom he kills. Now, many Jews could hide in Petra, but I think there will probably be too many to do that. So, uh, I think what's really going on is that some may hide in Petra, but others, uh, Israelis, as well as believing Gentiles, will go into hiding worldwide. And we, uh, the reason we understand that is because when Jesus returns a second time and the angels are sent to rescue uh, those people, both Israelis who believed and believing Gentiles, this is the verse, Matthew 24, 31, that tells us, Christ will send his angels with a loud trumpet and they will gather his elect, which I take to be Israelis, believing Gentiles, from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. So Petra may be a major place, but I think it's going to be much broader than that worldwide where there will be hiding places for Jews and other believers. Now at this midpoint of the tribulation, the question is how will God help the Israelites flee? Verse 14 tells us, the woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she could fly from the serpent's presence to her place in the wilderness where she was fed for a time, times, and half a time. From Daniel and other scriptures, we would understand again, this is time, times, half a time as a reference to three and one half years. Now, verse 14 is where some American Bible students really love to look at this verse. And this is follow their logic with me. Because an eagle is the symbol of the United States, and the two wings of the great eagle could be the United States Air Force airlifting fleeing Israelis. Hip, hip, hooray for the USA. Well, unfortunately, in a few weeks, we're going to study Revelation 17 and 18. And although um, it is possible, I think it is probable that if the United States exists at all during the tribulation, it is going to look nothing like the country that we know now. In fact, I think that when we study Re Revelation 17 and 18, that it is entirely possible the United States will be part and parcel of the empire of the beast and his consort, the economic, political, and religious future system called Babylon. But we'll talk more about that later, God willing. Fortunately, the Old Testament tells us whom this beautiful eagle symbolizes. I don't think it's the United States Air Force. Look at Exodus 19.4. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, God tells Israel through Moses, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to me. The eagle who rescues Israel will be none other than God himself, like he rescued Israel from Egypt from another tyrant named Pharaoh, who was a type of Antichrist. There may even be a prophetic dimension for future Israelites in one of Isaiah's most famous verses. Let's look at that. Isaiah 40, verse 31. Many of you have this committed to heart. But those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Picture that verse as a prophecy of Israel fleeing at the middle point of the tribulation to the place that God has prepared or the places God has prepared for them. So I would say the Lord himself trumps even our United States Air Force as much as we love our boys and girls who serve our country so faithfully. 
to protect us in the skies. Notice the prophecy also says that Israel will be fed in her desert hideout. How will God do that? How will God feed thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, or even millions of Israelis? Well, our, our all-powerful God has unlimited resources at His disposal because He's omnipotent. He also has divine creativity, divine ingenuity. So let's see from Scripture, I thought this would be kind of fun, how God might feed His people Israel during that last three and a half years of the tribulation. First, God could feed them miraculously with manna again, like He did in the desert once before when they left Egypt, Deuteronomy 8.3. God humbled you by letting you go hungry, Moses tells the, the generation in Deuteronomy. Then He gave you manna to eat, which you and your fathers had not known, so that you might learn that man does not live on bread or food alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Why is it that God lets us feel discomfort or pain in life? Why does He let us feel hunger, not just physical hunger, but other hungers at times? One reason is to teach us lessons that we could learn no other way. God let Israel feel hunger, and then He fed them so they would learn what counts most in life is not physical food, but our spiritual food, God's Word. So God could feed them with manna. He could also feed the future Israelites using birds like he did with the prophet Elijah. I absolutely love this. And someday we're going to do an Elijah, Elisha series here, God willing, if the Lord doesn't come back. 1 Kings 17, 2. Then a revelation, the Hebrew word devar, our, our word came from the Lord to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide yourself at the Wadi Kareth, where it enters the Jordan. You are to drink from the Wadi, I have commanded the ravens, God says, to provide for you there. So Elijah did what the Lord commanded. Elijah left and lived by the Wadi Kareth where it enters the Jordan. <laughs> the ravens kept bringing him bread and meat in the morning and in the evening, and he drank from the Wadi. After a while, the Wadi dried up because there was no rain in the land. There was a drought for three years. Now, think with me here. We don't, I don't want to derail the sermon, but ravens are unclean scavengers. And I've given you the verse back in Leviticus 11 to check out. But God used these unclean birds to feed a Jewish prophet who ate kosher food. W.A. Criswell, the famous pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas, <laughs> gave an absolutely marvelous sermon on this. All of his sermons in the series were great. That the ravens, this is his idea, the ravens stole the bread and the meat off of King Ahab's palace table and take, took them to um, Elijah out by the, by the wadi. And of course, uh, W.A. Criswell paints the whole picture that, you know, that the ravens, there were no screens in those days, so the windows would have been open. The ravens fly in and land on uh, Ahab's table. And so he picks up bread and throws, get out of here. And so he picks up a drumstick and throws it at him. And the, the, these big birds were probably like jackdaws. Pick up the drumsticks, pick up the bread, and immediately take it out morning and evening to Elijah. Now, uh, maybe it didn't happen that way, but it's, uh, it just, God has a great sense of humor. I'm sure someday when we get to heaven, we're going to see all these wonderful ways God did all these things. And here's a very interesting insight about ravens. Ravens naturally neglect their own young. They force their babies at a very young age to learn to fend for themselves. And yet those same ravens who treat their young that way so harshly, what C.S. Lewis would call a severe mercy, they're the ones God picked to take care of Elijah. Very interesting. Isn't God great? Another way God could feed those future Jews is by miraculously multiplying the resources they already have. And we've got to look at this passage, John 6, beginning in verse 4, about what Jesus did when He multiplied the bread and fish. Now, the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. Therefore, when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward Him, He asked Philip, one of His disciples, "'Where will we buy bread so these people can eat?' Jesus asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered, 
200 denarii worth of bread, eight months' wages for a laboring man, would, wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. You know, Philip had to be an amazing guy. Uh, we have somebody like that in our church, or Brother Everett. I mean, you know, I wouldn't know what to do in that kind of a situation any more than these guys did. But, you know, you just tell Brother Everett something, and he just says, and suddenly he says, oh, that's eight months' wages would do that. So I, I admire the kind of person who can do that. That's what Philip was like. Verse 8. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a little boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Now, this illustration really gets it wrong. I mean, this looks like this is enough food for a man. Most likely, these were little tiny griddle cakes, little matzo crackers that this boy's mom had made that morning. It's bigger than the, not any bigger than the smallest biscuit we can think of. And the fish would have been like little dried sardines. And so the miracle Jesus does is even greater than we think about. But of course, Andrew, let me just encourage you, being Andrew, he was always bringing people to Jesus. You don't have to win people to Christ. Just invite them to church. Offer to transport them. And just let God's Word and His Spirit work on them. So be an Andrew. I mean, what a great, <laughs> Simon Peter's brother, what a great guy. Verse 10, we've got to finish. Then Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. So they sat down. The men numbered about 5,000. Of course, they would have been women and children. Then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, Mark tells us he broke them. Then he distributed them to those who were seated. So also with the fish, as much as they wanted, when they were full, he told his disciples, collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. I agree with Jesus. I hate to waste food. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves, cheaper food, and that were left over by those who had eaten. So God could multiply the little that the Jews have there in the future. But there's one other way God could take care of them, and this is the way I think more than anything else that God will do it. God could use believing Gentiles to shelter, to care for, and feed the Jews. And one of the proofs is Jesus' famous parable about the future earthly judgment when He returns called the sheep and goats after His second coming. Let's look at the end of that parable. Verse 37 of Matthew 25. Then the righteous will answer Him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And so forth. And the King, Jesus, will answer them. I assure you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, I think the Jews during the tribulation, you did for me. Apparently during those seven years of tribulation, one way that believing Gentiles will exercise their faith in Christ is to hide and to take care of Jews. Next week, God willing, we're going to see how when the Antichrist comes to power, no one will be able to buy or sell without the mark called the mark of the beast. Of course, what will be going on will be, at the same time, you know, a black market, smugglers of goods. But one of the ways that brave Gentiles will show their faith is to hide and feed the Jews. They will be like Cory ten Boom and her family who hid Jews in their home in Amsterdam during World War II. If you have never read her bestseller called The Hiding Place, you need to put it on your nonfiction reading list. Probably, I would say, junior high up, uh, but uh, some elementary kids, I think, could probably handle it based on all the other stuff that's out today. You can visit Corey's home in Amsterdam, which is, here was the shop where they made watches and repaired watches. They lived upstairs. And here is the room where they had the back room and the hole is cut where you could see where they hid the Jews uh, back there in the back of the house until they were caught. And so if you go visit our missionary, Mike Duffy, whom we pray for almost every Wednesday, he lives not far from Corey Dimboom's home there in uh, Amsterdam. But eventually, as I said, they were caught and... Uh, Corey and her sister Betsy were sent to Ravensbrück uh, concentration camp where Betsy died. And Corey was released in God's providence because of a clerical error shortly before all the women in her age group were sent to the gas chamber. 
After the war, Corey helped Holocaust survivors. Later, she became an international speaker and evangelist. And when Corey ten Boom died, Israel, the nation, honored her by burying her in or at the Yad Vashem, which is Israel's Holocaust memorial. I visited it. It's very, very moving, like the one in New York. There's one in Dallas, too. Uh, and also buried there are other righteous Gentiles like Schindler and others who aided the Jews during World War II. Praise the Lord that there will be brave, believing Gentiles in the worst time in history who will help the Jews. And so uh, verse 12 of Revelation 12 may be referring to them. Let me, just, let me just make two quick applications here. I could have done it earlier. First of all, we should do what we can to help refugees. We should do what we can to help foreigners that God brings to either U.S. soil or overseas. Because, again, God can use their displacement as a means of bringing them to Christ. Brothers and sisters, forget the politics. God is at work in our world to bring people to Christ. And whether it's refugees or people who are here illegally, God allows that to happen so that they may find Christ. And we need to have a kingdom mindset more than we have a political mindset. Forgive me. And if God, another subject, if God someday can take care of His people Israel so magnificently, don't you think that He can take care of you and me right now? Whatever your need is, God is able to meet it. And if God chooses not to meet the need you think you have, He can help you grow closer to Him during that experience. One of the most wonderful lines in The Hiding Place is what Betsy told her sister Corey before her death in that concentration camp. And here it is. There is no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. Whatever pit you think you're in, God is deeper. God is stronger. God is greater. Now, because God does help Israel at this point, Satan, the serpent, brings a counterattack against Israel. Verse 15, from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river, flowing after the woman to sweep her away in a torrent. But the earth helped the woman. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the river that the dragon had spewed from his mouth. Wow, a lot of people really love to talk about these two verses. Now, <clears throat> there are symbols here. We've already seen the woman is a symbol of Israel, the serpent, or dragon is a symbol of Satan. But I try to stick to the literal as long as I can until its fulfillment proves me wrong. And, of course, I'm wrong often. Now, but let me just point one thing out about the water. Nomadic peoples who live in the desert, like the Bedouins, face a danger from water that we often do not think about. In the earlier verses about Elijah, do you remember? We saw the word wadi. That is a small valley in the desert, much like this one. And when it rains in the desert, it never rains in Southern California, but when it does rain in the desert, it is often a downpour, and this sort of place, this little wadi, can become a raging torrent. And so from the book of Job and from earlier in our studies in Revelation, I believe that both good angels and, and evil angels are able to control the weather to a certain degree. So it's no stretch of the imagination that at Satan's command from his mouth, that his fallen angels could cause a flash flood in the desert that would endanger the Israelis who are fleeing from Antichrist persecution. And then, of course, God steps in miraculously to save them. God has saved people before from water. Remember Noah and his family from the flood. God parted the waters of the Red Sea and the Jordan, which were natural barriers to Israel. And let's just think about this gorge where you enter Petra. Imagine being, and this is a mile long from start to finish, this gorge. Imagine being caught there in a flash flood. There's no way you could survive unless God miraculously stepped in to help you. Now, in verse 16, the earth is personified. It says it helps the woman. But we have 
read this same phrase in the Old Testament when God judged some rebels in Israel in the desert. Let's look at that. Deuteronomy 11, 6. Moses reminds them, What the Lord did to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, the Reubenite, when in the middle of the whole Israelite camp, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them, their households, their tents, and every living thing with them. So the same phrase used before, some sort of earthquake, earth split open. So if God could do it in the past, He can do it again. And that, of course, would be the perfect solution to a flash flood, would simply for the water to go down into the earth. God can choose how He does that. Verse 17, we're almost done. So the dragon was furious with the woman because he couldn't do anything to her, and he left to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and have the testimony about Jesus. I hope that describes you and me, that we keep God's commands and we have the testimony about Jesus. So Satan stood on the sand of the sea. Who are these rest of the offspring? Certainly fellow Jews, perhaps also believing Gentiles from all nations at that time who are obedient and who testify about Jesus. This last verse has an invisible to be continued. Let's bring up the next slide because next week, the big next one is the beast or the Antichrist comes up out of the sea onto the beach symbolically. And we'll talk about what that means. I want to close today with the words from Martin Luther's famous hymn, which I think are so appropriate. Follow with me, if you will. A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark, I love that word, a bulwark. Never failing. Our helper, He, amid what? (laughs) The flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. Yes, his craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side. The man of God's own choosing does ask who that may be. Christ Jesus. It is He. Lord Sabaoth, of the commander of the armies of heaven, His name. From age to age the same, and He must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear. For God has willed His truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. That word above all earthly powers. No thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours. Through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindreds go. Let this mortal life also, the body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that in the 500 years since Martin Luther penned that, In the 2,000 years since John penned the book of Revelation, not one iota of truth has changed, and it will so be forever. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here, my friends, that we would all cling to the truth of your word, and no matter what pit you may allow us to fall into, you will always be greater still. And I ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you.